Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Leah Schechter. I'm the Chief Program Officer of Shoki Jewish Family Service of Fairfield County. I'm pleased to welcome you to one of our Grisha and Ron Gross Jewish Family Life Education Programs. With great thanks to our incredible partners, the Federation of Jewish Philanthropy of Upper Fairfield County and their Program Director, Stacey Kamisar, and the Jewish Book Council. Tonight's goal and all of our family life education programming is to bring expert advice and relevant discussion topics that can better help members of our community lead meaningful, healthy Jewish lives while supporting and sustaining families. There is no better topic that fits the goal than talking about the challenges of raising children. I also have the pleasure of introducing our new Director of Clinical and Family Life Services, Brooke Davidson. She has just joined our team, and it's important that you know Tonight, you will hear from our presenters, but going forward, Shoki JFS and our clinical team are here locally to support you and your families through challenging life moments. Please do not hesitate to reach out to Brooke at any time. You will receive an email tomorrow with contact info and all of other relevant resources, which may be helpful now or in the future. A few logistics. You would think we would all be Zoom experts by now, but wanna give you a few reminders before we get started. We will be in webinar format for the duration of the program while the doctors are in conversation. If you are interested in asking our presenters a question, please enter it into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. When it's time for the Q&A, by the magic of technology, we will be able to make you a panelist so that you can ask your question directly to the doctors. This will mean, you will be invited to join the panelists on screen. Please be prepared to be visible to them and those listening and watching from home. Now we can turn ourselves to talking about the, some of the characteristics we've needed most over the last months. Resilience, self-reliance, security, emotional strength, and how we can support this best in our kids. Here to help us do that are experts, Dr. Gwen Lopez-Cohen, a Westport local, a graduate of NYU School of Medicine child psychiatrist in conversation with our featured speaker, author of The Scaffolding Effect and founding member of the Child Mind Institute, Dr. Harold Koplowitz. Dr. Koplowitz is a world-renowned child, child psychiatrist that introduces the powerful and clinically tested idea that deliberate buildup and then gradual loosening of parental, parental support, like scaffolding on a building, is the single most effective way to encourage kids to climb higher, try new things, grow from mistakes, and develop character and strength. We're looking forward to hearing all you have to share with us. And with that, I turn it over to Dr. Gwen Lopez-Cohen to get our conversation started tonight. Hello, welcome everyone. And I just want to say hello to Harold, uh, uh, Dr. Kopowitz. It's such a pleasure to see you. I, I was fortunate enough to be in my training at NYU when Dr. Kopowitz was the head of the uh, NYU Child Study Center. So uh, we go way back and it's really fun to reconnect. It's a pleasure. It's so much, it's the bonus for tonight. So to see you. Yes. <clears throat> so, uh, so uh, Harold, there are so many parenting books out there, I know, and uh, you know, I really enjoyed reading your book as uh, somebody who's read a number of these books. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about the basics of scaffolding and, uh, and the unique ideas that you put forth in this book? So I think if we think about this historically, um, many, many, many years ago, the idea was what are parents responsible for? And basically it was shelter, clothing your kids, feeding your kids, maybe educating them. And over time, uh, experts like Benjamin Spock got involved and started us to start to think that maybe we should really understand what our children want, not only their behavior. And Ben Spock was truly uh, a revolutionary when it came to pediatrics in getting parents to think about what behavior meant. And along the lines though, um, I think what happened was we started to be concerned that it was our responsibility to make sure our kids were happy. And that's when we start to get a new technique of parenting, you know, helicopter parenting, snowplow parenting, concierge parenting, you know, can I, can I get you another teacher? Can I move your class? Um, and since it's in our DNA to almost rescue our kids, to prevent our kids from feeling harm, we start doing more and more for them. 
the concept of a scaffold effect is that we shouldn't do everything for our kids because then they won't be independent. The message becomes loud and clear. You're incompetent. I have to do everything for you. So your child is a building. Your building is going up and you need scaffolding. You need pillars. You need support. You need structure. You need encouragement. You have planks and those planks include patience and warmth and guidance and monitoring and dispassion, which I happen to be very bad at, which means you shouldn't over cheerlead and you shouldn't catastrophize when your kids don't do something well. But it also means that failure is an option, that your kid will be able to fail a test. Your kid who doesn't prepare and doesn't tell you in advance that he has a test, that he may fail that test, or he may not bring in the project that he could have if he would have um, been more prepared, more organized. So when we stop saving our kids, we really are making them much stronger in the long run. So thank you, thank you. And the one of the things I really enjoyed were all of the vignettes from the different clinicians at the Child Mind Institute. I mean, this book was clearly a collaborative effort. And I would just love to hear from you a little bit about the important work that you guys are doing and how the idea came about for this book. So I'm, I'm very excited about the Child Mind Institute, by the way, which is all of 12 years old. The concept of the Child Mind Institute is being an independent nonprofit that's exclusively dedicated to children who struggle with mental health disorders or learning disorders. It's really based on what St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital has been, done, been doing for over 50 years, which is they were laser focused on childhood cancer. And by being laser focused, they changed outcomes. Um, when I was a kid, pediatric leukemia killed 94 out of 100 kids. Today, four out of 100 children die from pediatric leukemia. And our thought was the nation needs an institution that is just concerned about children's mental health. It's not to say cancer is not important or diabetes or heart disease, but when you have that laser focus, it really changes the way you think about the disorders and also what the proper treatments are. So to give you an idea of this, it, while cancer is very important, there's only 15,000 kids in the United States who have cancer. There are 200,000 that have diabetes. There are 7 million that have asthma and another, another 7 million that have peanut allergies. But we have over 17 million kids with a mental health disorder. So that means that everyone listening and watching tonight knows and loves one of these kids. So if it's not your son or daughter, it's your niece or nephew. If it's not them, well, it's your best friend's child or it's your child's best friend. So these disorders are remarkably real, common, and treatable. And so by being an independent not-for-profit, we raise money for one reason, to give financial aid to kids who can't afford the gold standard care we give. We do research, but our research, we share our data before we publish. So we really are the leader in open science because that's the way you accelerate the pace of discovery. And I think most importantly, we reach truly tens of millions of people with our public education messages. And that includes childmind.org, that includes childmind.org now in Spanish, um, that has reached 63 million families. But even during COVID, we went from half a million unique visitors a month to 2 million visitors a month. So parents are turning to us when they're concerned about distance learning, when they're concerned about how to talk to their kids about race and racism. Um, but to answer your question about how did this come about, one of the most common concerns we see parents having is that they worry about their kids. They worry, will my child be independent when I'm not around? What will happen when they go off to college? What will happen when I die? And so that fear about what to do about their children and the natural inclination to try to fix it seems to not solve the problem. And so we started to realize that we're telling parents all the time that they have to be scaffolds. They have to support their kids, but they can't decide whether this, their child is gonna be a skyscraper or a quirky Victorian or a mid-century house or a split level. The child, their DNA and their desires will, des will decide what their house will look like because they're gonna live in it. But it's our job to keep moving the, the scaffolding around so that they have healthy, truly healthy development and a strong foundation. So, 
Thank you. And, and you know, speaking of, uh, of um, coronavirus and the pandemic, this book is so timely because parents now more than ever are, are really hands on with their kids. And so can you speak a little bit about how the scaffold concept can help parents at this challenging time? Sure. So the scaffold effect was written before the pandemic. In fact, who could have ever imagined this was coming? The only part of the book I can tell you that was written, which was cared for during the pandemic is that I read the book for Audible. And I would recommend to everybody who's listening, if you write a book, it is, it sounds like a good idea to read it for Audible it is a horrible experience. You're put in a glass box, they keep telling you to say it slower, say it faster, raise your voice, lower your voice. But the most important message that I think the scaffold effect has for parents during COVID is self-care because self-care is childcare. If the scaffold itself is not secure and a catastrophe like COVID occurs, the building falls down. And so, you know, parents always say, well, what does that mean? Well, think about the message you get every time you go on an airplane. If the air pressure drops, please put the mask on yourself before you put it on your kids. If you can't breathe, you're not gonna be able to concentrate and put it on your child, especially if you have more than one child. But concretely, four things. If anyone's watching and really wants to do self-care, try to sleep seven hours a night. Stop Netflix, stop looking at your phone, sleep for seven hours. Number two, eat something green every day. A lot of people are gaining weight during COVID. It's not only because we're more often in our house than outside, it's because we're anxious. So try to have a balanced diet and have a salad every day. Third, do some exercise. If all you could do is a 20 minute walk, do a 20 minute walk, but do it religiously. And third, do something mindful. If you're not going to synagogue or to church, then just use an app like Calm and do it for five minutes. And eventually you can do some mindfulness for 20 minutes. The reason why self-care is so important, it's a great model for your children. Your children are seeing that you're taking care of yourself, that mindfulness is important, that spirituality is important, that balancing your diet by having time for exercise, that taking time for yourself is something they should be doing also. But it has never been more important as a parent uh, to use self-care right now than ever before. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I still remember from our training that you always would share with us uh, the importance of reminding parents to take time away from their kids and, and instructing us, you know, that telling us you would write prescriptions. Oh, you remember, time. I would actually write a prescription time to four hours in a motel and you're not allowed to talk about your child. And parents <laughs> would laugh, but they would recognize that if you have a very seriously ill kid, you do need some time away from your child and to take care of yourself because otherwise you, you have to go back and take care of your kid who is a full-time job. But there has to be some moment to take a deep breath. So yes, I, wise, wise advice. And could you talk a little bit more about the clinical approach at the Child Mind Institute that leads to such you know, compassionate and patient parenting? So I would tell you that the most important thing a parent can get from a doctor is an accurate diagnosis. And the, the reason we say that is that it seems obvious, but think about it. If you and I are both coughing and two other people are coughing, um, maybe none of us have a bacterial infection. None of us have pneumonia. So no one should be getting an antibiotic. But unless we get the accurate diagnosis, which by the way, for physical medicine is much easier, take a little bit of your blood, look at the white blood cells, and you can determine who has a bacteria infection, who has a virus, who has a, uh, an allergy, and who just has a scratchy throat. Well, clearly only the person with a bacterial infection gets the antibiotic. The person with the virus gets rest and some tea. The person with the allergy gets an antihistamine, and the person with the scratchy throat gets to gargle with salt water. The same can be said about a symptom like inattention. Not every child who has inattention has ADHD, and therefore not everyone should be getting medicine or you know, a psychostimulant like Ritalin or Adderall or Focalin. We have to figure out what the diagnosis is. So sometimes a kid could be bored. Sometimes a kid could be gifted. Sometimes a child could really have an anxiety disorder and therefore look inattentive or even be depressed and be inattentive. So we're very keen on the idea that before we say treatment begins, we, we have to know what the diagnosis is because then we don't, you know, diagnosis drives treatment. But I, I think the other important part for the Child Institute 
is that we recognize that the journey in child psychiatry includes a family that you know mom and dad may have thought when they were pregnant with their child that they would go see an orthodontist maybe even an orthopedist you know that maybe someone would break break uh, an arm or a leg or sprain an ankle they very rarely in their mind ever thought that they would have to go see a mental health professional and i think that it doesn't take much to worry a parent or for a parent to feel guilty to blame themselves somehow that they've done something wrong and that's why they're there so i think the important part for us is that we need parents as our partners parents don't cause mental health disorders they don't cause learning disabilities but what they do is they can make it better that if we can get them to be more consistent if they could understand that why sometimes they have to take the hard road with their kid to get them to the end uh, it makes it so much better when they're not fighting us and we're all fighting against the illness instead of against you know the diagnosis that is upsetting the parent Yes. Yeah. No. I, I. I. agree. Collaboration with families is really at the essential, essence of right? Yeah. The work that we do. Yes. And one of my favorite concepts from the book uh, was what you call believe in the moment. And right. so, for people who haven't yet read your book, can you speak a little bit about this? And yeah. so, so, I think think about it. We're always thinking about past mistakes. We're always thinking about what the future holds, right? Oh, if my kid doesn't do well, he won't get into the right school or he get he did poorly on that test. That's going to define the college admission. I, I mean, it doesn't take much for us to do that with our children or to do that with ourselves. So living in the moment is a good thing for, for us all to do. But I can tell you personally that, you know, um, I used to take, well, I have three sons and I would take each one of them on a trip every year. Now, not a vacation vacation, some place where I was invited to speak or a conference. So it wasn't always great. Sometimes it was Indianapolis. Sometimes it was Chicago. If someone was lucky, they got to go to Boca Raton and it was you know, not summertime. But my kids started to laugh that they knew that when we would get to the airport, I would always rent a convertible. It didn't make a difference if it was cold outside in Indianapolis. We rented a convertible. We turned on the heater. We played music that we could sing to. And our kids would say to me, oh, dad loves com convertibles. I didn't love convertibles. I was making memories and living in the moment with them. And also, if you do that with your kids when they're doing, so, you know, the other th concept I talk about all the time is catch your child being good. If you live in the moment, well, then you can forget that you've decided that child is lazy or that child is the brilliant one or that child. If you're living in the moment, you're looking at their behavior, you're experiencing their behavior. And also in many ways, you're leaning in. I think that if we treat our kids like clients, we will do a lot better. So that if a client was not, not very talkative and was saying yes and no, we'd figure out what questions we need to do to engage the client so the client really becomes entertained by us and and feels really that we understand them. And I think sometimes, especially I could tell you, I used to ask my kids, you know, uh, what did you learn today at school? And inevitably my kids, one of them would say nothing. And since they went to private school, I would say, okay, I'm calling up the school and I want my money back for today. And that was, a, you know, it was a funny joke, but if I really understood what was going on, I paid attention to what they said the day before about a homework assignment or about a test or a practice game or an actual soccer game to say so how did it go you know did you enjoy yourself was there you know were you able to really feel like a team you know what was the best part of the soccer game what was the best part what was the test a fair test and if it was what were some of the questions like in the way that you would show genuine interest with either a client or frankly when you were a teenage boy and trying to find out something about a girl that you were interested in so well, I'm sure those uh, memories of time in the convertible are, are timeless. Well, the funny thing is, is that one of our kids fell in love with the concept of a convertible and would constantly say to us, why don't we have a convertible? And my wife always used to say, every family has a pot of money. Some people's pot is bigger, some people's pot is smaller, and the parents decide how to spend that pot of money. And he said to us, what if you decide to spend the money on? And my wife said, private school. And he said, well, I think a convertible will be more important. And my wife said, you know, when you get your own pot of money, you'll decide to get a convertible. And it wasn't a bad, she wasn't judging him. She was just saying, you know, 
it was, there wasn't endless money. And even if there was a lot of it, parents make decisions on how to spend the money, which again, is, it's a very good thing to do to talk to your kid. I talk about this all the time on their level. You know, if you think about the scaffolding, if you're up on the eighth floor and the builders, you know, the, the building is going up on the second floor, you're shouting down, you can't hear each other. So it's trying to find where your kid is developmentally, socially, emotionally is really very important. I, I don't follow sports. It's, you know, my father was a great athlete. I just disappointed him left and right. But when my kids became interested in sports, I would make a point of, you know, following whatever the Mets were doing or the Knicks or the Yankees, whoever they were following. My middle, my oldest son loved Michael Jordan. He was like passion. I would follow the Chicago Bulls, not because I had developed a love of sports, but I realized if that's what they were interested in, I want to find, you know, get on their level. That was what I had. Those were the facts I needed. So, so yes, now I think I, all of us parents would agree that our kids take us places we would never expect to find right. ourselves. So, yes, yeah, I ended up at an Afropunk music concert in Brooklyn before COVID with one of my kids, and I thought, well, this is what he wants to be. And, you know, it's so funny, Gwen, because I talk about letting your kid get your kid out of their comfort zone, get into the growth zone. Here, your child said, hey, mom, I'm going to get you into the growth zone. A little discomfort, not overwhelming, but you you gain something from that experience. Yes, yes, no, absolutely. And I would love uh, to hear more from you about these scaffolding planks and especially dispassion. I thought that that was such a key concept and so helpful for parents. So I, I think that most of us are so invested in wanting our kids to do better than us, to have an easier life than us, um, that the bumps in the road are really hard for us to tolerate and to be dispassionate. So I can be very, you know, my kids hate the fact that I use them as examples, but you know, when one of my kids would have a fight with another kid in school, I was ready to take a contract out on that kid. I mean, I was so upset that that kid hurt my kid's feelings or beat him up. And I was always amazed that two months later, that kid was having a sleepover at our house. That, you know, how did they forget that that kid, you know, and why didn't the contract work? Why is that kid still breathing you know, after he hurt my child? So dispassion is really important because there are always going to be times where your kid's going to be super successful and super unsuccessful. And we're there to balance it out for them. They're, we're there to make them understand that it's a long road, that we shouldn't overinvest. So it's the same thing as standing on the sidelines of the soccer game and screaming, yes, no, you know, defense, defense, where you're not playing the game. And if you're screaming a little too loud, two things are happening. One, you might be embarrassing your child. And the second thing is that it becomes clear to your child that you really are invested in the game. And if the game doesn't turn out the way he wants it to, you're going to be disappointed. And that's very unnecessary, that it's supposed to be a fun experience or it's supposed to be a learning experience. The other flip side of it is when we blow our stack or we get overdue a grade. You know, they don't do well, but they really worked hard on it or they didn't work on it. They they were disorganized. And, <clears throat> I, you know, my mother once, you know, ninth grade, I got a 92 on a social studies test and my parents were immigrants. They were Polish Jewish immigrants and they had a group of friends that were Polish Jewish immigrants and they were incredibly competitive with each other. You know, these were people who were remaking their lives in the United States. You know, I was a physician, now I'm a pharmacist. You know, I was a lawyer, I'm now a social worker. And one of their friends uh, happened to uh, be the parents of, uh, of Leon Botstein, who has now gone on to run Bard College and also be the head of the American Symphony. And, and Leon must be 10, if not uh, at least 10 years older than me. And so I say to my mother, I got a 92. And my mother said, a 92, Leon Botstein is already president of Franconia College and he's 23. And I remember thinking to myself, who cares? Like, who is Leon Botstein? And then I was strong enough to say to my mother, mom, I usually get an 82. Let's rejoice in my 92. But the point was that my mother was so stuck with, frankly, because of her own experiences, that performance was really important. And that how you did was not only a reflection on me, but on them. That's not a healthy thing to do. It puts too much pressure, especially if you're a sensitive kid. I clearly wasn't that sensitive kid. But if you're a sensitive kid, that puts more pressure on you than is necessary. And I think high school and middle school and even lower school is stressful enough. 
So we want to talk to our kids in a special way. If they didn't do well in a test, how do you think, um, what could you have done better? Is there something I could do to make it easier for you to study? Do you think you studied properly? Do you think you gave it enough time, attention? In other words, you're really engaging them in problem solving and brainstorming instead of saying, you know, that's it. I'm taking away all your screens, you know, all, you know, for the rest of your life, you're not going to be able to use your computer. You know, some crazy over the top expression instead of dispassion, which is what your son or daughter needs when they've just experienced failure. Thank you. Yes. And, and that actually reminds me of another really key point that you make in the book uh, for parents. And I think something that all of us parents, you know, have to be mindful about, which is that, uh, you know, our kids are not us. And so if you could speak a little bit about this uh, concept in the book and, and uh, you know, how it um, factors into parenting. Yeah. So just think about this, that, you know, you you see yourself as a split level. You know, you you love the idea that you're split level. You have multiple interests. You are strong. You really succeed, but you pride yourself on being a good athlete as well as being a good, you know, lawyer, a good dad or a good mom. And your kid is just not athletic, has tremendous interests, let's say, in dinosaurs or in computers or in gaming, something that you feel is totally alien to you. And that speaks to, again, the fact that the house is going up without our DNA. It's their DNA. Now, our DNA is mixed in there, but uh, the best example is that uh, I love being a doctor. I mean, in a New York minute, I would become a child psychiatrist again. I can't think of a more rewarding way to spend your professional life than being able to work with kids, watching kids grow up. You know, you get old, the kids grow up. It is just a remarkably wonderful uh, career and it's getting better each year. In other words, there are breakthroughs in neuroimaging and breakthroughs in medication and, and better therapies than we had 20 years ago. My kids were all good science students and my oldest son was an especially good science student. And I thought, you know, if you're great at science and you're a good student, this is gonna be easy becoming a doctor. And at a certain point in maybe in 11th grade, 10th grade, he obviously figured out without me ever saying it that, you know, he wa I wanted to be a doctor and he turned to me and said, you know, I love science, dad. I hate blood. I don't really want to become a doctor because if I become a doctor, I'm going to become a psychiatrist. I don't even really like kids that much, but I'll always be the wrong Dr. Kopluitz. And I remember thinking to myself, it's that's my dream, not his dream. Now, I could tell you that he made us move our scaffold around because he decided in around 11th grade that he was going to become a DJ. OK, so it's not what you would think we signed up for, you know, but we scaffold him. We helped him get the equipment. My wife drove him once, you know, to three towns over, you know, literally in Westchester from Manhattan to do um, a gig for a junior prom. Um, and he went off to Brown, which seemed like the right school. If that kind of thing, you know, is very acceptable. And he got a radio program. And at the time, there were three white Jewish DJs. Mark Ronson, who's gone on to win the Academy Award with Lady Gaga, DJ Cassidy, who played at the Democratic, you know, uh, convention and gets twenty five, fifty thousand, hundred thousand dollars to perform, and DJ Josh K. And that's, you know, that's what we thought. You know, he seemed to be passionate about, it, very shy guy, very socially reserved. But when he was DJing, it really he came alive. He understood music in a remarkable way. In his junior year of college that summer, he worked for Goldman Sachs. And it didn't make any sense to us, but by the end of the summer, he was given an offer that if he would sign, they would give him a $10,000 signing bonus, and he would have a job the following September when he, you know, after he'd graduated. Uh, it didn't make any sense to us. In fact, he came to see me from Providence and with his mother came into my office at NYU and he said, I want to have a meeting. And he had a list of 25 reasons why he should take it and 25 reasons why he shouldn't. And I obviously lost my interest. And he said to me, you know, you're a very bad psychiatrist. I said, well, I actually happen to be an outstanding psychiatrist. I'm just not your psychiatrist. I don't understand why you're going to do this. This doesn't make any sense to me. It's a cultural mismatch. Goldman feels to me like it's an army. It, it just doesn't make sense. My wife, who's an artist, who's more like him, said, you know what, Josh, maybe you should just sign and say yes. And if you get a better job, you don't have, you'll give him back the $10,000, but maybe this will tighten you up. My son runs a private equity firm today. 
I would never have thought that's where we're going. And the important part is that he lives in that house, right? It, you know, maybe it's a skyscraper, maybe it's a sleek, you know, mid-century. It doesn't make a difference. It's his house. And it was our job to keep being supportive of him, you know, certainly to question him at times, to tell him this didn't make sense, it did make sense. But at the end of the day, once he made a decision to support it and to be encouraging, to give him structure, to give him support, and still those planks, you know, a lot of warmth, a lot of awareness, you know, um, and dispassion also, not to say I can't believe how disappointed I am that I didn't get a doctor. Do you mean it's like maybe someone will marry a doctor? But, you know, it's, and, and that goes also, frankly, if you do this well, they start scaffolding themselves later on. They go to college and they're having trouble. They go to the mental health service or they can't write a paper. They go to the writing center. They don't need you to keep, you know, hovering, which is that helicopter parent. You have basically given them the message that if they fall down or if they feel weak in the knees, you should reach out and get some help. What a lovely example of how you were able to stand back and just support your child to find their path their own way. Right, and, but Gwen, I would tell you also, the gut feeling we have is to say things like, you've got to be kidding, right? But, you know, sometimes you could do that with your spouse. But it's really, it's toxic. It's that's where you're no longer dispassionate. Uh, I, I can tell you that, you know, my kids are grown. You know, my youngest son is 33. My oldest son is 38. Um, about two or three years ago, and, and my youngest son decided like the last place in the world he would go would be Goldman Sachs. He graduates college. He goes and does a Fulbright uh, scholarship in, in Croatia studying the, uh, sanction, the effectiveness of sanctions against money laundering. And then he applies to law school, but then he tells us that he doesn't go to law. He's not going to law school right away. He's going to Argentina to work for a not-for-profit called Graffiti Mundo. And then once he's down there, he tells us he's become a certified yoga instructor. I mean, you talk about the scaffolding moving. I'm thinking a, a yoga instructor, okay? And then, of course, you know, he goes to law school and he goes to Harvard Law School in spite of himself. You know, it's like irritated that, you know, he's going to a brand law school. But at a certain point down the pike, we I'm sitting with someone and someone says to me, you know, I was speaking to Queen Noor yesterday. So I couldn't help myself, Gwen. I said, oh, really? I was speaking to Queen Elizabeth yesterday. And she said, no, you weren't. I said, well, who starts a sentence? I was speaking with Queen Noor. And she said, because I really was. And she said, Sam was working in for Oxfam in Amman, Jordan. She said, oh, she would, she will do anything to advance his career in Jordan or in uh, Great Britain. And I said, well, okay, I'll take the bait, why? And she said, oh, you didn't know he's dating her youngest daughter. Now, I have to tell you, it's good to be a psychiatrist because I didn't show any expression. I said, oh, that's interesting, you know, I didn't know that. And so then when I, I spoke to him, um, I said, were you ever gonna tell us about this? He said, it's not significant. We're just dating. I'm coming back to the United States. I wanna work for Elizabeth Warren, and whatever it is that he was. And um, jokingly, I said, well, the only good thing here is that my mother's dead. And so he said, what? And he said, I said, my mother was snarky about Jewish American princesses. I can't imagine what she would say about a Jordanian Arab princess. And he said, dad, she'd love her. She has a PhD. She's very serious. I said, well, we'll never know. My mother is dead. But it's okay to use humor with your kids when you know that he's made a decision. Because if he had made a decision, as hard as that would have been for me to wrap my head around, I would have I know that we would have backed off and we would have, my wife and I would have struggled, but we would have waited to see what was going to happen and not preemptively say, you can't make this decision, we're going to make it for you. Right. What, a, what a great example of patience. And <laughs> in front of the child, always in front of the child. You know, they used to say, never in front of the kids, patience in front of the kids, dispassion in front of the kids, behind a closed door, you could say to your wife, what did we do wrong? I mean, what is going on here? You know. It's like, Right, right. And I, you speak a little bit in the book about being a grandparent, which yes. is yeah. amazing and beautiful. Uh, so, you know, there may be some grandparents in the audience. What, so, what, so I, I have to tell you, the, funny, the funniest part about grandparenting, and, I, and the reason I tell the story in the book, is the fact that, you know, it's about bias, right? We all have a bias for our kids. We, we think our kids are really good looking and smart. And so, 
I think my grandchildren are really beautiful, my, especially my old, you know, when the first grandchild comes, I think he's really quite beautiful. And it's confirmed for me by his parents who say people stop them in the street and say how beautiful he is. And then I have other friends who have grandchildren and they tell me their grandchild is beautiful. And I look at the picture and I, kids a misguide. I just don't see how this kid is so beautiful. And they say people stop them in the street and say how beautiful. So clearly people like babies, but it's one of the things that we have to watch out for as parents, as grandparents, that we are not neutral. We are, we have a bias. And so that if a teacher tells us that compared to all the other little boys, eight-year-old boys she's been taking care of in third grade, that your son is more active or more impulsive or more inattentive, we should listen to that because we we have that bias, right? We we think our kid hopefully is really a you know an excellent student, a terrifically obedient child. And so when others tell us, we should be aware of that bias that we have. The the other part about it that's just so much fun is that you know when when Jackson was very little and he'd get very angry, he wasn't a big talker and he would shake and he'd get down on all fours and literally start banging his head against the floor, which frankly, I thought was very amusing because it's exactly what his uncle Sam did. And then when it started to hurt, they would stop, you know? And I was, you know, I had full confidence that my son and daughter-in-law would figure this out, but it's amazing how genes work that, you know, and so much easier as a grandparent because you don't have to get excited when he's banging his head, <laughs> what is wrong with him. Instead, it's kind of like this too shall pass, you know? Well, it's wonderful. Uh, so we should talk about bias just for a second. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we know what the word confirmation bias is now because of how divisive the country is, right? So if you are a progressive liberal, you're most likely watching MSNBC. And if you're very conservative, you're most likely watching Fox. And the reason for that is you want people to confirm that what you believe and what you think is correct. That's confirmation bias. So what happens is that if we think our kid is lazy, if we think our child is just a genius, we look for behavior that confirms that bias. And it's bad for the kid who we think is perfect because she or he is anxious that he could slip at any moment. And it's certainly bad for the kid who we think is lazy or disobedient because they're gonna feel pretty crummy about themselves. Their self-esteem is gonna suffer. And one of the things I talk about in the book is try to really track all behavior, not only track behavior that is going to confirm your bias. So the easiest behavior to track is good behavior. Catch your child being good for at least two weeks. Start looking and seeing every time your child does something good. You ask them to set the table and it took two or three times, but they did a beautiful job setting the table. Make sure that you label it that you praise it. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. you did a really terrific job setting the table. Thank you for clear, clearing the table. It really makes me feel good. So very specific praise, but catch your child being good. Ignore the insignificant off task behavior. Just ignore it. It's hard. It's like a shiny penny, but ignore it and only intervene when the child does something egregious, bites the other kid, throws plates, curses you, whatever you find totally egregious. Two things are going to happen after around two weeks, it usually takes six full weeks, but after two weeks you'll see some change. One, your child's going to think that someone captured their mom, that the body snatchers have taken their child. It can't be my mom because she's always telling me to put my napkin on, stop talking with my mouth full, you know, silly things that she focuses on. The second thing a parent notices, your kid gives you more and more good behavior. It's amazing how we are wired to do good. To, to, to want praise from our teacher, to want our parents to think the best of us. And sometimes when we feel we're trapped, that we can't get out of the box, we're always doing something wrong, we just do more of that to get some attention. But if you can flip this, if you could rewrite the blueprint, it's kind of amazing. And by the way, it works with spouses also. And it also works with employees if you catch them being good. Yes, a little labeled praise can go a long way. Absolutely. And one of my other um, you know, favorite aspects of the book is how succinctly you go through the hierarchy of, of when should parents worry about their kid? You know, I, when when should parents how do you just how should how can a parent begin to think about when, uh, you know, something is a problem versus just temperament or a regular part of development? Right. And so we talk, we have actually little boxes in different parts of the book to say, this is normal development. 
this is problematic, and this is a disorder. And most of it, if you think about it, it's on a spectrum. And the two Ds that I always look at are distress and dysfunction, and then think about two weeks. So if you see that your child is really unhappy, you know, going to school is so problematic, crying and in distress or can't sleep at night, keeps running to your room and getting into your bed, that, that's distress. The dysfunction is that once they're at school, they can't pay attention. They're just so upset that, you know, there's a fire engine that went by and they think it's going to their house and something bad is gonna to happen to mom and dad, or the dysfunction is they can't, they're so inattentive that even though they know the material, they can't answer the questions properly. Distress and dysfunction that interferes, again, with the life of the child at work, at school, with their parents, or with play, and it lasts for two weeks, means that you should pay attention to it. And the reason I say that is that if anyone develops a rash while we're talking, Within two hours, they're gonna go and get some cortisone, they're gonna put something on it, and two days later, if it's not gone, they're going to call their doctor. And two weeks later, they're gonna see a dermatologist. So if we're gonna give that kind of respect and that kind of treatment to a simple skin rash, we should do the same for your child's mental health disorder or a learning disorder. So yes, absolutely. And I like that time frame of two weeks, you know, to collect multiple data points because kids are so variable day to day that Well, Gwen, the really sad part is that on average for the United States, parents wait eight years depending on the diagnosis. So for certain disorders, the disruptive ones, the ones that the kid is making a lot of noise in class, it'll be two years. But for the quiet kids, the anxious kids, they can wait up to eight years. It, you just think about that. It, forget the fact that once you do make the decision to go see a mental health professional, there aren't enough of us out there, and you might be stuck on a wait list for so long, but it's the fact that we still feel so much shame, and we are hoping that maybe it's just a phase, and it's that kind of lack of information uh, that really, in many ways, hurts the child, because the sooner you do something, the better it is. A symptom that's only a month old is so much easier to treat than a set of symptoms that are two, three, or even eight years old. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I see that a lot in my practice with inattentive attention deficit disorder, that those kids fly below the radar until they hit a wall and start having academic problems. And, and, and you know, to your point, uh, you know, the sooner the intervention, I think the better the outcome. You're going to feel better about themselves, right? You know, after a while, you do believe I'm just, I'm not that smart. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not a good student. Instead of you're, you're very bright. It's just that when we put 10 kids, 15, 20 kids in the class, your mind wanders much faster and for much longer. So, so well, it, um, so I think at this point, we're uh, going to see if there are any questions in the audience. Uh, so for the um, attendees and participants, if you have any questions, this would be a great time uh, to run them by uh, Dr. Kopowitz. So I will get us started with one of the questions from the chat. Um, you just talked a little bit about dysfunction um, versus distress. Um, and especially now with the overlay of COVID, um, the question that came in in the chat is, how do we now deal with the, in these particular times where anxiety is even higher than it usually is, fears are higher? Um, how does that change uh, the 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 way you look at what's typical distress and typical dysfunction mm -hmm. to what is that situation now in such heightened uh, challenge times. So let's make it clear, COVID has been terrible for everyone. I mean, this is, and the kids who suffered the most are initially were 13 to 24 year olds. So if you really wanted to make varsity <clears throat> soccer and you know, you're 14 or 15 years old and soccer was canceled, it, that's gone. You mean you might make it the next year, or if you want to be the captain of the football team, and for four years you're working really hard, and football got canceled, and the same for the lead of the the play, or the same for the prom. You know, no matter what we say, it was worse for them than it was for us. You know, my life, this will be a terrible bump in the road for my life. But considering how long my life has been already, I think that you know. I, I can have some perspective as upset and as languishing and as demoralized as I can get about COVID. For these kids, their timeline is much shorter. 
kids now are even suffering who are kindergarten to second grade, their reading levels are absolutely scarily, scary low, that we're going to have to figure out ways to do interventions and remediation on a federal basis. It's, you know, I'm not really worried about middle class or upper middle class kids. I am worried about poor kids and how, how they're going to fall behind, that their learning loss is so much greater. But I think that COVID had one, two silver linings. One, we have telemental health. It's just kind of amazing. It cuts down on transportation. It makes it so much easier to get a hold of someone, even if they're many, many miles away from you. But the other piece is that parents are paying more attention. And so I think that if your parent, if a parent knows their child pre-COVID or during COVID, they know how they sleep, they know how they eat, they know what they're passionate about, they know how much they love, you know, certain shows or certain games. You know if they're a, a, an introvert or an extrovert. And you see a change in behavior. You start seeing that your kid is he's not eating, or he loves ice cream and he stopped eating ice cream, or he doesn't care about the Knicks anymore, or he or he doesn't want to watch or play Fortnite. Those are red flags that parents should start to worry that this is, you know, that's distress. Dysfunction is that we have expectations for our children to to attend school, whether it's in person or on a screen, to do their homework, to uh, participate in some kind of family activity to you know which means eat their meals with us when they start avoiding that when they're sleeping during the day and they're up in the middle of the night that's when we start to see those two d's and if it's more than two weeks then it's more than a phase and the worst thing that can happen is that you go to a mental health professional and they tell you it's nothing it's normal development it's just being a teenager or you know or they tell you it's something and the most important thing you need from a doctor besides the diagnosis is you need a treatment plan. If they tell you, oh, we'll see how it goes. No, no, no. I want to know, is it 10 sessions? Is it 12 sessions? After four sessions, will we reevaluate? Will you tell me, you know, when would medicine come in? When would medicine not be necessary? I'd like to be an informed consumer. I want to be part of the process. I understand you won't tell me all the secrets my kid's telling you, but I need to be able to help you, doctor, and help my kid. So I need to know some guideposts here so that this is not going to go on for 20, 30, 40 sessions without me knowing where the path is. So I think we have Joel joining us now to ask you a question. Great. Hey, Joel. Hey, it's good to see you. Hi, Gwen. Um, thank you for all your, your wisdom and sharing uh, your experience with us. Uh, I come to what you're sharing from uh, a background in positive psychology. So I just wondered, uh, so much of what you're talking about is dysfunction and how to deal with that. And I'm a parent of three daughters. Um, but from a positive psychology standpoint, for instance, um, uh, positive psychologists would say, approach your kids from the standpoint of strengths. Understand their signature strengths, and there are ways uh, via character is one of them. Identify their signature strengths, and then spot those strengths in action, and as well help them understand when they're maybe underusing or overusing those strengths, as opposed to focusing on weaknesses. And I'm wondering whether you've incorporated that in your work and what you think of that. Well, I think the whole concept of catching your child being good speaks to that. That they're, you know, you can the noisiness, you know, the the, the shiny penny of a kid who, I, I think the best example is for a teacher. They go into class and you, the teacher says, you know, I'm gonna call on people who've raised their hand and who discovered America. And the first kid screams out Christopher Columbus. And it takes a lot of effort for the teacher not to scold that child and say, I told you you had to raise your hand. You know, yes, the answer's right, but please sit down. Instead, to actively ignore insignificant off-test behavior. And the next kid raises their hand and you say, thank you for raising your hand. What's the answer? And they say, Sandy Koufax. And you say, no, that's not correct, but thank you for raising your hand. And you keep doing that so that the teacher is basically praising positive behavior. Raising your hand gets the teacher's praise. It makes you feel good because I followed the instructions. And I think that on a daily basis, that's what we should be doing. We should be finding are trying to find and catch our kid being good, it's as parents, when we start to notice that they're suffering in any way, that's the red flag. That's when you might need a professional that your child's not sleeping anymore and you can't figure out what, what's keeping them up 
or your child's having a, t a time going to school, the attendance has become problematic. There's a lot of stomach aches, there's a lot of headaches. So as a parent, I think you should be aware of distress and dysfunction. On a daily basis, I'd like parents not to be doctors. I want parents to catch their kids being good instead of criticizing them. And I think it's very easy to criticize. You know what I mean? It, you know, what's wrong with this picture? People have no trouble with that. You know, the napkin's not on the lap. They're eating, you know, they have their elbows on the table. They're chewing with their mouth open. Those are all insignificant behaviors. And if you only focus on that, your interaction with your child is not gonna be very positive. It's gonna be a negative interaction. If you can hold back and say, hey, that was a really interesting story, or you know, uh, I, I'm so glad you could share it with me. I have an interesting story. It changes the whole dynamic of the uh, uh, child-parent relationship. So Harold, we have two more questions that have been asked. Um, one is, how do you handle the idea of taking two to six weeks to ignore <laughs> minor bad behavior right. um, and to really focus on that one child and give specific praise when the child has a younger sibling? Um, meaning, you know, the five-year-old who's often has some poor behavior in minor ways that we want to, you know, target, um, but that then the two-year-old starts uh, doing what the older one was doing. Um, right. Hard to sort of, you know, step back a little bit and give it but, some time. Right. So, so six weeks is a very long period of time. That's one of the reasons I say reevaluate after two weeks because you need to recharge yourself because it's very hard to break old habits, right? Redrawing a blueprint is not the blueprint for the kid, it's the, your blueprint of how you interact. But I think that we can find positive behavior in a two-year-old also, in the same way that we can find positive behavior in a five-year-old. So actively ignoring insignificant off-task behavior, not significant, you know, if your kid bites you, or if a kid, you know, has a temper tantrum, or your childhood, those things usually parents have to intervene. Um, how, you know, throwing things off the table, you, you know, those timeouts. But if as a family, we make the decision, mom and dad, we're going to try very hard to bite our tongue for silly things that we know are silly, that in the long run won't make a difference. And that's what I talk about in the book. We always are trying to rescue our kids. And if you're rescuing a kid, then everything becomes important. And if you think to yourself, I'm in the long game here, and in the long game, I certainly want my kid to feel good about himself. I want my kid to be able to tolerate um, failure. I want my kid to be able to tolerate distress when someone doesn't like him or someone raises their voice to him at school and you know, disciplines him and he feels it was unfair, but that he can deal with that because he's resilient. So yes, it's gonna be hard, but I think basically you're going to find good behavior even in a two-year-old. I think we have Barbara joining us with a question. Okay. Hey, Barbara, your camera's not on. And now you're muted. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Barbara Greenspan. I'm an occupational therapist for children. Hi, for Dr. Lopez Cohen. Okay. <laughs> With children, for children, about children. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. Um, and I think I would say, I think you need to use more OTs because we really get it. Um, but one thing that concerns, well, many things concern me, but before COVID, I, you know, I was seeing three-year-olds who were anxious and that just, you know, I, and I like to say I'm a child of the sixties and seventies. Um, and, um, sorry. And, and. You know, for a three-year-old to have anxiety is a very, it is a very sad direction that we're going into. Right. Um, so let's, let's just talk about this for a second. We have a real problem before COVID. We have, you know, I don't know how many OTs there are in the United States, but there are 8,500 child psychiatrists. So if you have 17 million kids who have a mental health disorder, clearly the child psychiatrists are not going to be able to, to take care of those all those kids. Number two, there is some very bad news that was occurring right before COVID. The rate of suicide attempts among teenagers and the rate of completion of suicide jumped at, right before COVID started from the four years before. So traditionally, historically, we've been losing 5,000 young people to suicide every year. It's unacceptable. It jumped 
to, to in 2019, it jumped to 6,120. Now think about that. That's almost a 25, 30% increase and you heard nothing about it in the news. But even more telling was that the number of kids who went to emergency rooms for suicidal behavior or suicidal thoughts, severe thoughts, I'm going to kill myself, make me stop, kill, I, someone stop me, went from 600,000, which means one a minute, to 1.2 million visits. So that's one every 30 seconds. Now, again, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that we as a nation never did anything about it. COVID has just made it worse. Now, the only thing that I could say about COVID is that everyone talks about children's mental health right now. So that the state of California in June gave the Child Mind Institute $25 million for one thing. How can you produce some kind of prevention? So we said to them, we would suggest that every child learn five skills, understanding their thoughts, understanding their feelings, how to, ima how to manage emotional stress, how to do relaxation techniques and what mindfulness is. And clearly the way you teach lower school kids is different than middle school kids versus high school kids. And you need to do it in Spanish and English and you need to do it with videos if you're going to do it because you have 6 million kids in public schools in, in California and 300,000 teachers. And if you want the teachers to use these videos, you're gonna to have to incentivize the teachers. That's how this bill came to 25 million. So we spent $6 million on professional movie makers making 34 films. Um, for the little kids, it's very fantasyful and it uses a hedgehog. For the middle school kids and the high school kids, they're five minutes to seven minutes you know, to do each one of these skills. Um, there, it's a, it's a very famous Indian comic who did a special for Netflix. And for the parents and the teachers, we use Danny Pino, a very handsome guy who was in Law and Order, played the dad in Dear Evan Hansen, and he's a natural Spanish-speaking individual, so he could do both, but good. So now we produce the 34 videos, plus we have curriculum, plus we have parental tips, and the state of California says, we'll put it on our website. I said, the chances of anyone watching it on your website. So we then got another $6 million to go to Facebook, and Facebook will give us $3 million more to do a digital marketing campaign starting January 26th. You're getting this before everyone else. It'll be on the Today Show on January 26th. And then we got $100, another $6 million or $7 million to give $100 to each teacher who can prove they're a public school teacher in California and spend 30 minutes watching the five or you know the five videos for their grade or you know for their school years and answer three questions. Now, will it work? I'm not sure. It's based on social emotional skills teaching that we've done in person with 60,000 students in 600 different school districts. But we did it in person. But we're, we're willing to try it because frankly, I think every kid should know these five skills and they should practice those skills. And if you want a teacher to do more, you should pay them because and the reason why they kept giving us more money, it turns out California didn't want to deal with the teachers because then they had to deal with the unions and they didn't want to do with marketing because they said, we just don't know how to market. And it would be uh, problematic if we got involved with Facebook. So frankly, we're trying to get Governor Lamont to adopt this because it's cheaper now. We already spent the $6 million building the videos. Right. Now we just need money for the teachers and for the marketing plan. So for a state like Connecticut, it's mostly going to be $4 million. But how do you, you need to figure out a way to make the army bigger? If you're not going to get increase the number of child psychiatrists or OTs or and maybe social workers, maybe psychologists, they, I don't, I'm not complaining about my salary, but this is not a lucrative field. It is very labor intensive. Uh, there's a reason why most child psychiatrists stop seeing children as they get older. And since they're general psychiatrists also, they just start seeing adults, you know, and work from eight to four. Um, so I think we need to make pediatricians better, which means you're going to have to reimburse them. If they're going to take care of ADD and anxiety and maybe autism and depression, then you have to train them. And the reimbursement rate has to go up for insurance companies. But I don't think this is a piecemeal thing. I think this, when the Surgeon General actually comes out and says we have a mental health crisis in our children and he's blaming it on covid i think okay i'll take it even though i think we had a mental health crisis beforehand and you know if that's politically wise if that's the way we're going to do it it's all right but we really do have a crisis and you're a grandmother i think it's getting worse 
I think it's absolutely getting worse. I'm not a grandmother. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, I thought you said. Oh, I thought you said you had four children. Who had, oh, I thought you said you had four children who have children. I'm sorry. No, just a correction there. Okay. Um, well, you will be a grandmother. <laughs> I will give a yes, and I will give a. But I'm going to give a shameless plug for OT because OTs know those five things inherently. Like, let's use them. Maybe yes. appeal to AOTA. Like, but OTs know this. This is in our blood. Right. No, oh, I, I appreciate yeah. your advertisement for OT. I absolutely do. <laughs> well, no, but, I, because and, I'm and so concerned. Sense. Look, as I just said, the army has to get much bigger. It's yeah. it, you're, you're losing too many kids. Yeah, right. I agree. And so really, I scary. Thank you. I have another question coming in. I'd like to get in before we wrap up tonight. Okay. Um, this is thoughts on competitive high schools. Um, mm -hmm. They cause a lot of anxiety, but also have kids strive for excellent uh, excellence. Um, what should parents watch for or be looking for if they're exploring, you know, some of the competitive high schools? And sure, I think you have to find a school that works for your child. That's the most important thing. And it's very easy to get sucked into brands and labels. And you know whether it's a private boarding school or it's you know one of these in New York City the competitive uh, schools that you have to take exams to get into. Uh, Ma uh, Gla um, Gladwell, Malcolm Gladwell uh, had something I think it was in the Tipping Point or maybe it was the second book where he talks about that if you go to a less competitive college. Uh, you can maybe get higher grades and do better out in the real world because you're seen as someone and you feel like someone who's a straight A student. And, and I would tell you that, um, I, you know, I could use the example of my own family. Uh, all our kids went to the school, the private school that was diagonally across the street from our apartment building. And my wife taught in the school, so we got a discount on the tuition. And that's how we made the decision. And when it became clear that one of our kids really didn't belong in that school, it took a lot for us um, to accept that for more than one reason. One, we were family of that school. Uh, the other kids were in the school. And it took a while for us to think about what was best for our child. And, and the child wasn't sure either because he wanted to stay with his brothers, right? And he wanted to be across the street from the school. And at a certain point, you have to make a very hard decision to say, is my child thriving in this environment? Is my child really going to be feeling good? Is this school giving my child the opportunities to be successful? Um, and, and it doesn't mean straight A's. It means to shine, to feel you know empowered, and not to get caught up with those labels. Do you mean which you know we all get caught up with? You mean it's um, in good ways and bad ways. I can also tell you, I went to the University of Maryland, and it somehow all worked out. So, you know, and uh, the evidence is, is that if you go to a school where you feel you're, you're thriving and you're getting something out of it, I think that can work whether you're in a small Ivy or, you know, one of those competitive little schools later on in college. But it goes the same way that if you don't want to put your kid into a pressure cooker, if they're not the kind of kid who thrives with pressure. I mean, some kids actually do great with that. That competition really works for them. And others, they just wilt. And you have to know how that match works. Do you have, so we have offices in um, New York City on 56th Street. We have offices in Harlem and we have offices in Staten Island. Uh, we also have offices in the Silicon Valley. Um, and I think best right now we have offices everywhere because of tele telehealth. You know, it's it's unbelievable how we're seeing kids from literally forty eight different states in the United States. Uh, for some reason, Nebraska and North Dakota haven't come to us. I'm always ready to pay someone to <laughs> send their kid to us so we could say all fifty states. But that's a joke. But um, it, frankly, you know. I think it's important to get the right diagnosis. I don't think it's necessarily important where you get treated as long as you're getting the right treatment, but getting that diagnosis straight is really the, the most important step. Great, wow. Well, what a fascinating conversation. I wanna thank you, Dr. Lopez Cohn, for moderating this important discussion. And thank you, Dr. Kopelitz, for sharing your insights with our community. Clearly, you gave us so much to think about tonight.
Well, thank uh, you for including me and in, and giving me the treat of seeing Gwen. So yeah, that was it was it was such a wonderful come back and forth conversation. So we really so appreciate it. And I also wanted to say that on behalf of our local Federation for Jewish Philanthropy, I'm so thrilled that all of you were able to join us, albeit virtually. Tonight's program is a great example of the importance of bringing community together to engage around pressing issues. And we are so grateful not only for the partnership of our Jewish Book Council, but of our longstanding friend and beneficiary agency, Jewish Family Service. We hope you will all join us for our future programs. In fact, our next author talk is coming up uh, shortly on March 7th, when we partner with the Westport Library and the Westport Playhouse for our Jewish Community Read. It's a wonderful book called A Play for the End of the World. That's a fictional account of a real life play that was actually performed in an orphanage in the Warsaw Ghetto. Learn more about this book and our other programs on our website, jewishphilanthropyct.org. But most importantly, please remember that our Federation and our local Jewish Family Service are here for you, our community, especially in these unique times. So please reach out if you need our support or there's any way we could be of help to you. So have a good night, everyone. Please stay healthy and safe. And thank you so much again, Dr. Lopez-Cohn and Dr. Kaplowitz for joining us this evening. Good night, everybody.